Thank you for being here today. If you're here inside, it's just a good day to be on Pensacola Beach. Amen. It's a good day to have a good day, and I'm, I'm glad to be here. We're going to finish up a series, Seize the Day. I'll talk a little more about that. So we've broken this thing down, seize the day. The term itself, it's, it's a Latin phrase. It's, it's, a, it's a BC phrase, so it's a pretty old phrase. But the word actually means to, to, it's almost like to pluck an orange or to pluck fruit. It means to pluck the day. And so it's, it's, it's the real overall theme is to make the most of every opportunity you're given. Make the most of every day. Make every day count. Here's our theme verse if you want to jump there. Ephesians chapter 5. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise people, but as a wise person. Well, how does a wise person live? This is what a wise person does. They make the most of every single opportunity. In some versions that says they redeem the time. Some versions says they, they make every minute count. But the reason they do that is because they know the days are evil. That word, that word evil, really, it should just say because they know the days are uncontrollable. Can I get an amen, right? Anybody had some uncontrollable days in 2021? I had probably several hundred in 2020. Uh, so uncontrollable days. And so we can't control the day. We can't control the way I've, I've heard it said is, is, is we really can only play the hand we're dealt. We can't, we can't deal the hand, right? We can't play the hand to ourselves. That's what we try to do sometimes. We just, every day, we play the hand that we're dealt. And so we've broken this up into, I think, the way that we all see our lives. We see our life as past. We see our life as present. We see our life as future. We look back and we, you know, you, if you really want to know where someone's going, a lot of times, look at where they came from. And so week one, we framed our past and we went back. And we looked at the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? And, and we found that when we can take the things in our past, especially those, the, the, the painful moments, it's the painful moments, it's those times in our life that God uses. I, I've, God doesn't waste pain. He doesn't waste pain. We love pleasure. We seek pleasure. We live in the land of the lotus eaters is what I call it. But, but God is not found in pleasure a lot of times. God can be found in the house of pain, Ecclesiastes. And so God doesn't waste your pain. God doesn't waste the mistakes. God doesn't waste the failures. God doesn't waste the people that walked out on you and hurt you. And, and he takes those things in our life and he uses those as a catalyst. The Prince of Preachers said it like this, that I've learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. I've learned that what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. The people that left me, I'm going to write them a, a, a thank you card and put a Waffle House uh, gift certificate in there and say thank you for being so mean to me and hating on me and, and writing all that bad stuff about me and saying all those things about me because you made me better. Come on, somebody. They're here, I promise, online. There's some people in here. <laughs> Last week, we talked about eating the frog. Mark Twain said if, if you've got to eat a live frog... It's best to do it first thing in the morning. And if you have two to eat, go ahead and eat the, the largest one first. And so last week was, was really about the present. And the present can be defined, what do I do right now is, is, is this acronym to win the day. What is important now? Win. What's important right now? Not what's urgent. One of the best books, and it's one of my favorites because you can read it in about 30 minutes. It's a little book. It's called The Tyranny of the Urgent. The tyranny of the urgent. I bought, I mean, I've probably given a hundred copies of them away. I keep dozens of them. And, and the tyranny of the urgent talks about how Jesus, even though he was free-spirited, he lived on a calendar. I must go through Samaria. I must get to Jerusalem. It seemed like he was just kind of hopping on boats and traveling around like, you know, real no set calendar. But he had a set calendar. And what he didn't do, he didn't let the urgent get in the way of the important so we eat the frog first. We put first things first. And then today, I've been waiting on today. <laughs> this is my favorite topic, really is. This is my favorite thing to talk about, is the future. So I know where I've been. You know, I know where I came from. I've looked at my past. I've connected the dots. I found out that life doesn't happen to me. Life happens for me. That all the stuff that I've been looking at that's happened to me, no, 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 no. It happened for me. It strengthened me. 
gave me the resilience I needed to eat the frog today to do what's important. And so now I'm looking forward. I think the last 33 years of my life, I've been looking backwards a lot. And some of the best advice I've ever been given is the most painful moments of your life, write them down in detail. Go back. Don't hide from it. Because it's never as bad as you think it is. Because that's where God is. That's what he's going to use to catapult you into your future. Because it's, it's the pain. It's that stuff. It's that stuff that God uses the most. And it gives us, it's, it's like we, we all want a testimony, but nobody wants a test. <laughs> we all want a message for the world, but nobody wants their life in a mess. But it takes that to, to, to get to a point where you can talk about it and when you can help someone else that's going through it. And that's, the, that's what I believe, that's where the future really lies. The future isn't, in, isn't found in, I mean, we all want to retire and sit poolside somewhere and just chill for the rest of our lives, right? But you get bored. <laughs> we need a mission. We, you know, you, you got to have something to look forward to. And, and the whole idea of retirement, I don't like it. I really don't. I just I think that we're I think God has called us all to, to be on mission for the rest of our lives. And then when you get to the point where you can retire, you have the most to offer to the world. You've lived now. You didn't learn that stuff in the classroom that you got. Come on. You've got the scars. You've got the stories. Tell somebody. Look to the future. And so that's what we're gonna do today. The word dream is used a lot in the Bible, around eighty times. The word vision is used around a hundred times. And so dreams and visions are the language of God. I believe that with all my heart. Dreams and visions are the language of God. When it comes to your future, God is already there. All right? He's the Alpha and the Omega. God stepped out of time and created time. God is in your next week. God is in your next month. God is in your next year. He's already there. He knows the end from the beginning. He sees your life not kind of in a timeline, but he sees it as a completed picture. And so when it comes to what you should do in the future, the first place you should start is there. <laughs> because he knows the future. For you. He, he knows what's coming. And, and so a lot of times God will he'll give us glimpses of it, right? He'll give us a glimpse of it, a moment. And we can't shake it. Now, we all have dreams, right? I mean, some folks dream more than others. But it's those dreams that you cannot forget. It's the dream you had when you were seven, and then you had it again at 12, and then you had it again at 21, and then you had it again at 35. So a dream happens. So a lot of times when we want God to speak, we think in our five senses, what we see, smell, right, taste, touch, all that stuff. But God oftentimes will speak outside of our normal senses in what I like to call the imagination. That's what dreams are. That's what a vision is. A vision is something you have while you're awake. It's a vision is when you have a, you know, and, it, and it's all throughout the Bible, visions. And, but dreams are, we're more comfortable with dreams because we do it a lot. But it's, it's, the, it's the language of God. It's, it's how I believe God encourages us. It's how when, when you look out the window or you look at the world you're living in and you don't like what you see, it's the dreams that God drops in our heart of a better tomorrow that keep us alive. It's the dreams of a better tomorrow. It's the dreams of a better future. The people that changed the world didn't have a lot of money. They had a dream. The people that changed the world didn't have a lot of people that supported them. They just had a dream. And it was the dream that got them up every day. It was the dream that motivated them. It was never money. It was never about how much influence they could gain. It was all about the dream God placed in their life. But unfortunately, we grow out of it quick. We all, we all come into the world dreamers, but then we are standardized, tested out of that. I just tapped on some toes right there. Come on. Right? We stop dreaming. We're told to live in reality. That's just not the case. C.S. Lewis, though, he had a different approach. He said this, one of my favorite quotes, You're never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. I think as soon as you start dreaming, you stop dreaming, you start dying. As soon as you stop having something in front of you to live for, if you've arrived and everything you need, you've got it all. You've got all the money you need. That's why Jesus said it's harder for a rich man to get to heaven than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. You know why he said that? Because a rich man don't need nothing. 
But when you have a dream that's bigger than your reality, you need something. And so the world needs people to dream. The world needs you to live your dream. And sometimes we put dreamers in a category of their own. But I think every person on the planet has a dream that they're here to fulfill. They have something God's put them here to do. More than pay bills, retire, and die. There's a dream in you. There's a dream in you. There's something God has placed inside of you. And I want to help you find it. And one of the greatest books I've seen on this is the book of Zechariah. Now, Zechariah, a little bit about Zechariah. He was a minor prophet. Zechariah was a, he was a dreamer. Uh, and just to give you a little bit about Zechariah, in this book, in his book, it's an it's a Old Testament book, there's ten visions that Zechariah has. Ten. And we're going to just read four verses in chapter four. But the, there's the first eight visions that Zechariah has had. So Zechariah was a visionary. This guy just had dreams and visions. You know, Moses seen a burning bush. Zechariah may have been burning the bush. Okay, because uh, he, 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 the whole first four uh, chapters are like, what is this guy talking about? But what's really cool about Zechariah's visions and dreams is he knew when he didn't understand what God was saying, so he asked. The first eight, he didn't know. He was just having these visions and, and was like, what is going on? And, and so we're going to pick up in chapter 4 where God interprets it for him. But what's amazing about Zacharias is, is the, every one of those visions had a literal, translation, tra a literal translation into the life of Christ. So when Zechariah had this vision, this was way before Jesus ever stepped foot on the earth. And they were all about him. But when it comes to visions and dreams, I think they have literal translations and a lot of times uh, what we'll, we'll approach scripture or I will and I'll try to sermonize it, right? I'll, ser I'll, I'll, I'll try to tell you what the horses represent and I'll tell, try to help tell you what, what um, you know, all these visions of Joshua represent and what she, you know, and try to apply it to our life today. And that's one way to do it. I don't want to do that today. What I really want to do is look at the pattern of how Zechariah took all these crazy dreams and visions in his life and was able to actually figure out what God was saying, and how, how he was supposed to live his life based on what God was telling him. And so in order to do that, I think we got to get in Zechariah's shoes. Now, Zechariah was the youngest prophet to ever live. He's probably in his 20s when he wrote all this. And so he was overwhelmed. You ever received a vision, like a real big vision that just scared you? You were afraid to even tell anybody about it? Can I get one witness in here? Like, if I tell people about this, they're going to think I'm a little off my rocker here. Overwhelmed. But a visionary, as simply as I can put it, a visionary, a dreamer, somebody who has a dream in their heart, is, it's, it's just a preferred future is what it means. It means this is where I am right now. This is where I believe God is calling me. And there's this gap. There's this gap. And so Zechariah received this vision from God, and he didn't quite know what it was. And there's, I want to give you three things that, that, was, that he was, how he was able to interpret it. I want to just read the verses for you. I want you to just listen to these verses. This is the first thing he says, God, Zechariah 4, verse, verse 6. He asked God for the interpretation to all this stuff. And this is what the Lord said to him. It's not going to be by force. It's not going to be by strength. It's going to be by my spirit, says the Lord of heavens. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain, will stand in your way. It's going to become a level plain. And when the final stone of the temple is in place, the people are going to shout. May God bless it. May God bless it. Then another message came from God. Again, Zachari Zachariah doesn't know what he's seeing, but God is interpreting his vision for him. Another message came. You're going to lay the foundation of this temple. You're going to see it through to completion. Then you will know the Lord of heaven has sent you. And then he says this little phrase, don't despise the day of small beginnings. And so I think those three or four verses is the heart of this book. 
And there's a pattern there. So I'm not looking for, you know, so much the prophetic. And prophetic means future events that he's talking about here. I'm looking at the pattern of how he took all this vision and dreams and things that God gave him and was able to walk it out. Because we all love dreamers. We all talk about dreamers. And, and, and Zechariah was certainly a dreamer. And, and I want to talk about one dreamer that I know that we're all very familiar with. But before I talk about him, I want to talk about his dad. His dad was a pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. And in 1934, he got the opportunity to go to the Holy Land. And so this, this pastor in Atlanta went to the Holy Land. And on his way back, he stopped in this little place called Berlin for a conference. And then in Berlin, they were, they were, they were studying this guy named Martin Luther. So the pastor, his name was Michael. Well, he was coming back from, from Israel, and, and he heard about this guy named Martin Luther. Martin Luther, he's known as the first Protestant, Protestant Christianity. Everything kind of birthed out of that. He, was, he protested, Protestant, he protested the current state of the church, and he came up with the 95 Thesis. And he took it, and he nailed it on the, the front door of the castle and said, hey, I don't agree with what you're doing, with what you're doing, and I think things could be better. And I want to give you all 95 of them. I'm going to just, I think they boil down into two. It was number one, I know the Bible is right and you're wrong. That was it. <laughs> you're, you're, you're interpreting the Bible for everybody and that's not how the way it's supposed to be, right? It, it, you, the Bible is right and you guys got it wrong. That was the first one. The second one was this, stop proselyting and prof, profiting off of religion. They were selling forgiveness of sins. And he was killed for this. I want you to know that. I mean, they, 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 but this, this stirred that pastor from Atlanta, Michael, so much that he decided to change his name to Martin Luther King. He had a son that was five at the time, Michael Luther King. Changed his name to Martin Luther King Jr., and so the passion that was birthed in his dad found its way into the heart of his son. And so little doctor, or not doctor yet, but Martin Luther King Jr. went on to follow in his dad's footsteps and became a pastor. I've been to the church, the last church that he pastored before he began the civil rights movement. I've stood behind the pulpit. I've walked out the front door of it in Montgomery. And you turn to the right, and it's the Capitol building. And so at some point, again, this, he was a dreamer. I don't think he knew where his life was going. I, I'm sure he didn't. And if God would have showed him, it would have probably scared him. But he had a dream in his heart that he got from his dad, that his dad got from somebody else, that he was following in his footsteps. And so Dr. King was a Baptist preacher. And I was able, I've, I've always loved to watch his sermons and I've always loved to read his manuscripts because he would manuscript his sermons a lot of pastors do that. They will write out every single word. And I've, I do that for funerals and weddings and stuff, but I don't do that all the time. But, was, but that's the way that he was trained. And so he had a pretty big speaking engagement <laughs> that a lot of you know about. And so at that time, he was, very, he was, you know, he was on the world scene. And so he had a speech writer. And it's known as, the, you know, the, the, he marched on the Capitol Hill with about 250,000 people. And it was about freedom and jobs. And so his, his, his manuscript of that day, the Civil Rights Movement, when it was really birthed, it, it had nothing to do, it had, there was nowhere in that about a dream. I want you to hear this. And so at some point, Mahalia Jackson spoke out of the crowd and said, Martin, tell them about your dream. Well, one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. And so he got off of his notes. And he got into his dream. And I want you to know that after that, it was a year before it ever really made it to Congress. And then it was five years after that he was assassinated. And so a large part of that dream that he had, he never got to see. 
And so what is vision? What, is it, what does it mean to have a dream? It means to be so passionate about something, you're willing to risk your life over it. You're willing to step out and speak what you believe God has called you to do and say. And what I love about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is the way that he approached this. He said things like, hate is too heavy of a burden to bear. He said things like, hate cannot drive out hate. 250,000 people gathered on the, that day. Not, I couldn't find one injury. Couldn't find one fatality. They were there for jobs, but a lot more was happening in the hearts of people. A lot more was happening in the hearts of people. And I think when we read about dreamers and we, and we it, it lights a passion in us to want to do something greater. It, it ignites a passion in us for a world maybe that's just beyond where we are right now and what we see. It ignites a passion in us to love our neighbor as ourself. To lay down our life for the person next to us. And so Dr. King, little did he know what he was saying in that moment. That goes down as one of the greatest speeches ever recorded. He quotes the Gettysburg Address in it. The Gettysburg Address was, at that time, the most famous, but he spoke from here. He spoke about his dream. And if you read his sermons and you go back, and even in his church in the early days, that's the message that he had. His platform just changed. And so how do we live into the footsteps of someone, a, a man as great as that? How do we follow our dreams? How did Zechariah do it? That's what I want to give you very quickly. Verse 6, the first thing Zechariah says is, when it comes to living your dream and the, God, the dream that God has birthed in you, you've got to realize where it comes from. <laughs> it's not going to be by might. It's not going to be by power. But it's going to be by the Spirit of God. And I've quoted that verse a lot. Not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit. And I think God, when he, when he is birthing something great, the first thing he wants to make sure is that no man can get the glory for it. He said, I want you to take your name off of it. I want you to take your church symbol off of it. I want you to take your logo off of it. I want to get the credit, and I want to get the credit alone. And when we're able to do that with our lives, when we're able to, to, to get behind the vision of God and say, I don't care if my name's on a plaque anywhere. I don't care if they put a bust of me out front when all this is said and done. I just, I have a dream in my heart that I want the world to hear. That's where greatness begins. That's when, that's when I, I, one of, someone I love dearly told me this this, uh, this week. He, he believes that that God shows up when we do things for other people that we know they can never repay us. When we help people with no intentions of ever being helped back. When we do it because we know it's right. That's when you know God is involved in something. That's when you know. And, and, and he has to, I think he made this real clear to Zechariah. Before I give you the vision, before I give you the plan, I'm gonna, he gives him the plan. He interprets all of these visions for him. Zechariah lived a rich, full life, and he was honored as a prophet. But before that, God said, hey, before I use you, I want you to know one thing. Don't ever put anyone's name above mine. Because it's not going to be by might. It's not going to be by power. It's not going to be by anything but my spirit. And so great works, number one, are done by God's divine hands. And a lot of times, if we want to live our dream, go find where God's working and get a, grab a towel and start serving. <laughs> if you want, to live, you want God to fulfill your dream, find a place where God is moving, where, where God's divine hand is operating, and everybody sees it and everybody knows it, and just start serving. And, and, and God will, will bring just life to your dreams. I, I, just, I believe that with all my heart. If you can serve the dream of someone else, God will send people to serve your dream. But I think they all start with the spark of divine. It's when that idea hits. 
It's when that, that, that passion, it's, it's, it's divine hands. And, and God wanted Zechariah to know that. That it doesn't depend solely on you. It doesn't depend solely on the movement. It doesn't depend solely on the people. If it does, it's going to come and go. But a real divine dream, a dream birthed by God, it's, it, he, I think he sees in generations. Generations. I mean, it's, you're talking hundreds of years. God will see his purposes to pass. But it's birthed with the spark of divine. It's, it starts with the divine hand of God. One of the things that we did as a staff, as a team in 2020, and I didn't come up with this idea. I borrowed it from another pastor that's a way bigger church. But he asked everyone, when everything shut down, everything was you know, done, I was coming up here recording messages in an empty building, a lot of our, you know, a lot of our team didn't have, you know, what they did changed. Normally it was all about this, Sundays, and setting up and getting ready. That stopped. And so a lot of you, I know in your industry, the same thing probably happened. You went online, things shifted around. And so I sat down and, and we asked, we, we went through this, where are we manufacturing the most energy? I asked our team that. Where were you manufacturing the most energy in 2020? And when it went away, it was a joy. Think about that. Where are you manufacturing the most energy? Where were you striving and pushing? And as soon as you stopped, it just went away. There was a pastor in Texas, and he got a little, a little frustrated with his church, and he said, we're going to stop everything. <laughs> I'll quote him. You know, I came to the place in my ministry when I was so tired of pushing programs, we decided that we weren't going to give anything artificial support to any part of our church. And if it didn't run on its own, we were going to let it die a decent death. Big church. Sunday school went away. A lot of the programs they were doing went away. Several years went by like that. The church kind of got smaller, but do you know what happened? started getting bigger again. <laughs> then they went to two services. Then they bought more property. Then they bought another building. Then they bought another building. Then they bought another building. But what I want you to see is this. What in your life are you having to sustain? Or where in your life are you trying to be God? And trying to make something happen that maybe the divine hand is just not there. And I'm trying to force a square peg in a round hole. And God has moved on. It's getting quiet in here, Jesus. Uh. And so, we, you know, we stopped everything. And I told our team, we're not bringing a lot of it back. Where were we manufacturing energy? Where were we having to do everything? Where was three people responsible for everything? And, and, we were and it was just burning everybody out. And everybody was tired. And everybody was upset. Look at your life that way. Why, you know, why does my kid have to play 17 sports? Does he have to play badminton, tennis, soccer, um, you know, chess, football, baseball? I'm getting real up in your grits this morning, okay? I mean, y'all, I, mean, I know it. And I, I mean, I'm just, and if I'd have drank coffee, we'd have been here till like noon. <laughs> so um, just stay with me. Great words are stunned by God's divine hands. You can't, you can't force it. And, and then the other part is we want to go back and try to recreate what God did 10 years ago. It's done. Thankful for what God did 10 years ago and 20 years ago and a lot of the churches that are empty now. Let's move forward. All right. Here's the next one. And this is where it gets really tough. Next thing he says to Zechariah is this. He, he talking about Zerubbabel. Now, this guy is a governor. So this is a secular guy. This is not a Christian or, you know, Israelite or anything like that. He's not a Jew. He was the governor. So God connects Zechariah, the priest, with political leaders, the governor, and things start happening. And he says, this is what's going to happen with this vision, Zechariah, I gave you. Zerubbabel is going to build it. The foundation of this temple, his hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord God has sent you. And so the first step is God's divine hand steps in. The second step is this in our life. When God gives us a dream, we know it's God. This is God. i got to move forward with this. The second thing is then God says, all right, roll your sleeves up, and it's time to get some sweat equity involved. 
And that's the part that's really tough, I think. So it starts with divine hands, but then it continues. The foundation of the work that God has called you to do will be laid by human hands. And so it's birthed by the divine, but then God says, okay, I've got a place for you to get involved. I've got a place for you to serve. I've got a place for you to, to connect. I've got somewhere. This, it's, it's, I've heard it said like this, God will never do for you what you can do for yourself. And sometimes we'll pray for God to take away our bad breath, but God gave us enough money to go get a toothbrush <laughs> and some toothpaste. And we're praying for God to take care of our bad, our bad breath, and he's saying, go down to the CDS, get you one of those nice little toothbrushes. And we're waiting on God to do something, and God's saying, I've done my part. I showed you the dream. I spoke it to you. Grandma told you a hundred times. Grandpa prayed it over you. You know what God's put in your heart to do. Yeah, it's going to be hard. Yeah, it's going to be difficult. Yeah, people aren't going to like it. Yeah, there's going to be opposition. Yeah, you're going to doubt it. Yeah, you're going to feel like maybe you're crazy. Yeah, there's going to be a million other things that you could probably make more money doing. But is it your dream? Does it get you out of bed in the morning? Are you excited? Do you Start with passion. Start with love. Start with what you feel God has called you to do. And, and if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And we're, so it's, it's the human hands gets involved. It's the, it's the sweat equity. You're, it's, 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 putting in the, it's putting in the work. It's putting in the time. It's, I've heard it said like this, that great things are accomplished when we pray like it depends on God and we work like it depends on us. Great things happen when we pray like it depends on God and we work like it depends on us. So I'm going to pray like it's every bit of that. I'm going to pray like if God doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. I'm going to pray like it depends on God, but I'm going to work like it depends on me. I'm going to show up early. I'm going to stay late. I'm going to stay up. I'm going to work my nine to five, but I'm going to do my side thing because I got a dream. For 10 years, that's what this was for me. I worked at, that's right, come on. But I had a dream in my heart. I was, I was crunching numbers and doing spreadsheets and golfing on Fridays. I wish we could bring that back. Um, but uh, but uh, I, had a, I knew that there was more to it. I knew that this wasn't it. And I'm finding that God will never give you your dream job if you can't be faithful at the job you don't like. And we're praying for dreams and daisies, but God's saying you need to get a shovel and dig and be faithful where you are. And show up on time where you are because nobody's going to hand it to you on a silver platter. I don't care how many degrees you got. Whoo. My name's Nathan Pooley. I'm your friend. <laughs> I love you. I did drink some caffeine this morning, okay? Y'all, I just couldn't tell you. I had a little bit. Last week I was sitting on a stool because I was caffeine deprived. I told my wife yesterday, if I die today, I'd rather die having a cup of coffee this morning. <laughs> Anyways. All right. The foundation of these works are laid by human hands, and here's the last piece of it. He says, and I love this verse. He says, don't despise the day on the way to your dreams. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. And you may have to work, you know, Denzel Washington, I love Denzel. He talked about how his acting career and what it took to get to his acting career. And he said this. He said, I did what I didn't want to do so I could do what I wanted to do. <laughs> do what you got to do so you can do what you want to do. And you might be working hard right now, and you may have so much, most of your life may be going somewhere else besides that dream that you've just held on to for decades but don't let it go. Don't despise. I mean, it, 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 there's no telling where God may win his timing. He just, just might all of a sudden say, okay, it's time. This dream that you've had your whole life, one person, one phone call. I can't tell you how many times that has happened where I've had a dream in my heart and I didn't have the money nor the people to see it happen, but I didn't give up on it. And God would literally send a raven with a fish in his mouth. I mean, I'm not even kidding. Like, send people through the door. I have no idea who they are. Hey, why didn't the words work on the screen this week? Well, we need this, 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 and this. It costs three grand. Oh, here's my credit card. Go buy it. 
That was, you know, 2013 when, I, when we first started Upper Room. And that just kept happening. And that just kept happening. And, and so what, we, what, what, what the temptation is is to follow those people around and say, hey, 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 I got a bigger dream. Hey, hey. But it's like God saying, no, 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 no. Come on. I'm going to be real with you, all right? I'm speaking the truth this morning. You may not get it next week. I'm going to be off coffee next week. No more coffee for you. It wasn't even coffee. It was something else. But But God's saying, if you'll just stick with me, (laughs) stay true to the dream, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I got a million more where that came from. And so we confuse it sometimes. It's because it's easy to do that. And we think that they're footing the vision, and they're not. It's God. And when we live that way, we try to operate that way, it's frustrating. We've got to stay true to what God's called us to do, even if we've got to go back and start over. He said, don't despise a day of small beginnings. The Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Go to the next verse. He talks about this plumb line. He says he rejoices to see the the plumb line. And that plumb line, basically, just to be as simple as I can put it, it's just a string with a weight on the end. And so when they would go in to build a building, they would bring in the architects. And they didn't have all the, you know, incredible software we have now. They had a plumb line. And so they would just mark out the corner. And that's, it was just basically saying, don't be afraid to dream again. To try another, shoot another shot. Maybe you've tried a million times. Try one more time. And what I love about God and when it comes to pursuing your dreams, we talk about a a God that nothing's too hard for or nothing's too big for. But I think the reality is this. The God that we serve, nothing's too small for him. And sometimes a simple act of replying to a text or just getting that vision board out again or just deciding, okay, just, just one little small step in the right direction. God's saying, I can turn it around. I can, your dreams, let me just give it to you this way, your dreams will be achieved in inches, not miles. It's getting up every day and putting it in front of you. It's getting up every day and reminding yourself. God will speak through dreams. I wish I had time to tell you about the dreams. Uh, 14 years, 13 years ago, my wife had a dream while we were dating that I was preaching in a building with windows behind me with water. Two years in the upper room before we remembered that dream. The marina where we sat, where I was at, where we were at for eight years. God will, will give you glimpses. But it may take you 10, 12, 15, 20 years. It's long obedience in the same direction. It's being faithful every day and saying, oh, know what? If I move the ball one inch today, that's a win towards my dream. If I move the ball one inch today, you know, I, I, I want to I take it miles at a time, but sometimes it's just small little steps. Dream big, but start small. Big things always start small. Always. As a seed. We pray for oak trees. God gives us acorns. And so how do we make this practical? I wanted to tell a story, and I'm not going to tell who this person is, but they hear from God, and I know they do. And a few weeks ago, something happened. They seen a, uh, an employee of a bridge builder a company, you would know the name very well, got flicked off at a Tom Thumb. And so this person drove every day to work from, and seen the signs that was towards this certain bridge company about fixing their mess, and, and I don't know who all suing them, but there, you know, there's a lot happening. This person's heart broke. He said, I, I just don't feel like this is right. I want to do something. So they called over and said, we want to just let you all know we're glad you're here. We're thankful that you're building the bridge that our children's children's children will drive over. And we want to feed you. We want to do a lunch. And, I mean, it just, it's, I got, all I got was an email about the idea. And when I seen it, I thought, we need, that's, yes. (laughs) 
you got a yes. And it just, just, it just went on, and I mean, it just took on a life of its own. Multiple churches, you know, got involved. They, this company brought in all of their employees so that we could feed them. And it was incredible. It was amazing. I don't know what's going to come out of it, but I know something big happened. Because one person heard from the Lord and decided to step out and serve the people that most people were wanting to. Now, what does that have to do with the gospel? Well, I think it has everything to do with the gospel. Because Jesus said, I don't really care what you believe. I'm going to know the way that you believe by how you treat your neighbor. <laughs> and you can quote the, all the fundamental truths in the world, and you can give me the greatest theology that you got, and I know there's people in here way smarter than me. I didn't go to a formal Bible college, and I really don't want to. But if your theology doesn't affect your psychology and the way that you treat people, then maybe you should go back and try it again. Because Jesus said it like this. Not only does he care how we treat our neighbor, he cares how we treat our enemies. The people that want to hurt us. The people that we think don't like us. The people that we don't like. <laughs> he said this. I think it was Matthew 25. I was hungry. You gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. I needed clothes. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison. And you came to visit me. But the righteous will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did you need something to drink? When did, when would, a stranger, we would have invited you in. Jesus said, if, well, you probably didn't recognize me. <laughs> I was that company you didn't like. I was that person that you had a preconceived idea of that you were told not to like. But that's where I was hiding. In your enemies. And he says, if you do it to the least of these, you've done it to me. It's amazing what one small act of kindness can do. This company brought in executives. They brought in the, all these people from all over to be there that day. I got to hand 300 I mean, employees peach cobbler. And they had tears in their eyes. It's our neighbor. They live here. They work here. There's just a few people that don't live and work here that are working on that bridge. They couldn't believe it. God was there in an incredible way. I had nothing to do with it. But I think that's... Buck says it like this. Just pull the string. When you feel God speaks to you and it sounds crazy... That might just be <laughs> to love your enemy, go feed them, to let them in your house and serve them, to, to, to do something for someone that you know can never repay you and probably won't. Sounds like the gospel. And when we pull on those strings, there's no telling what's on the other side of it. It's miracles, it's signs, it's wonders. It's, it's the kingdom of God invading earth. It's heaven moving men and women. It's, it's, it's transformation. It's transcendence. It's, it's God in the flesh. It's the Holy Spirit. He's attracted, I believe, to that. When he sees someone hurting, that's what Jesus did. He, went, he said, show me where they were. The, show me the person that's hurting the most. I want to go there first. I want to go there first. So I believe that, that as, a, as a church, that's what God's called us to do. I've always said this is a place for the prodigals. We've built this church out of a lot of folks that may don't, you know, just feel like they didn't have anything to give or anything to contribute. And, and I'm finding it's those people, if you feel like you're one of those, that are the dreamers that God uses to change things and to move mountains and to, to see the kingdom of heaven come to earth. So let's do this. Let's just bow our heads and we're going we're gonna to pray together. 
Father, we just thank you for your, your goodness. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that even now you're reaching out in compassion. We believe that you are here in this place. And so, Lord, we just, I pray for every dream that's in the hearts of your people right now, that you would ignite a passion inside of them. Lord, don't let us give up on our dreams. Don't let us let the people that we love give up on their dreams. I believe that, that one of the, God, that your spirit, even in this moment right now, that you're, you're taking us back to those dreams. You're, you're restoring that vision and that passion. And it's the dreams that, that you give us that elevates us. It's, it's the dreams, the glimpses of heaven and being with you for eternity that makes this earth just so much more delightful, knowing that we know where we're going. We came from somewhere and we're going back to that place. And in the meantime, there's a dream in our heart from heaven that we want to see happen on this planet. And I think the first step to that is giving your heart to Jesus. And if you're in this place and you've never just surrendered your heart to him, you should do that right now. Maybe you've hitched your wagon to a lot of people and they've let you down. You've hitched your wagon to organizations and they've let you down. You've hitched your wagons to denominations and they've let you down. You've hit your wagon to all kinds of stuff. I want to invite you to just hit your wagon to one man right now. Who's the king of kings and the lord of lords. And there's nothing you'll ever face that he cannot and will not step in. He said he'll never leave you or forsake you. You got a friend right now that sticks closer than a brother. He's moving in this room. You should grab his hand. Lord, we give our life to you. We ask that you would ignite the dreams and the passions inside of us. Don't let us get distracted by everything we see around us in this world right now. Help us stay true to the dream, true to the vision, true to who you have called us to be. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen.